Uh, today we had as a special guest uh, Senator Hillary Clinton, who spoke to us at breakfast time. Tomorrow, Senator Dodd will address our breakfast. He's now the chair of banking and finance. He intends to help convene the Wall Street community to look at its role in reconstruction. But as for now, the congressman from Ohio, Congressman Dennis Kucinich. Thank you very much, Reverend Jackson, uh, for the opportunity to join with you at this important forum. And I want to thank everyone who's on this stage uh, for the chance to work with you through the years. As uh, some of you may know, uh, Reverend Jackson and I go back a ways. We've uh, marched together. We've stood on picket lines together. We've helped organ organize uh, voting together. We've helped organize voting registration together. Uh, we've been together all over this country, and it's an honor to be with you here to talk to you about what and with you about the new direction this country can take out of Iraq and back to the American city. Uh, that'll be the topic of my speech at the noon luncheon. And uh, what I'd like to do this morning is to uh, talk about the first part of it, which is how do we get out of Iraq? Uh, before I, I go into those brief remarks, I want to acknowledge the presence of Steve Cobble. Steve uh, worked with uh, Reverend Jackson in his presidential campaigns and has uh, worked with me uh, in the 2004 campaign. Steve, I want to thank you for, uh, for your presence here. I also want to acknowledge uh, those who are part of my effort in New York City, uh, Alice Slater and uh, Angelica Kushi. Thank you for your presence here and, uh, and my national campaign, Chad Ely. Uh, we, we have an effort that is informed by my years of experience as a city councilman in Cleveland as a clerk of courts in Cleveland, as a mayor of the city of Cleveland, as someone who lives in the city, as someone who's a product of the city, as someone who grew up in the city, whose parents never owned a home, who lived in 21 different places by the time I was 17, including a couple cars. Langston Hughes once wrote, life for me ain't been no crystal stair. But when we have had that experience, we, it's easy for us to put things in perspective about what's important in life and about what's important for a nation. That's why I'm choosing this opportunity in this important forum to talk about the Kucinich plan for uh, getting out of Iraq. We know that in November of 2006, after this upsurge of violence in Iraq, the American people moved decisively to reject Republican rule, principally because of the conduct of the war. Democratic leaders well understand that we regain control of the Congress because of public dissatisfaction with the conduct of the war. But two months later, Congress is still searching for a plan around which it can unite to hasten the end of U.S. involvement in Iraq and return home of 140,000 troops. Now, there's a compelling need for a new direction in Iraq, one that recognizes the plight of the people of Iraq, the false and illegal basis of the United States war against Iraq, the realities on the ground which make a military resolution of the conflict unrealistic, and the urgent responsibility of the United States, which caused the chaos, to use the process of diplomacy and international law to achieve stability in Iraq, a process which will establish peace and stability in Iraq, will allow our troops to return home with dignity. But right at this moment, the administration is preparing to escalate the conflict. They intend to increase troop numbers to unprecedented levels without, a stand, without establishing an end date for the so-called troop surge. By definition, escalation means a continuation of the occupation, more troop and civilian casualties, more anger towards the U.S., more support for the insurgency, more instability in Iraq and the region, and a prolonged civil war at a time when there's general agreement in the world community that the solution in Iraq must be political, not military. Iraq is now a training ground for insurgents who practice against our troops. What is needed is a comprehensive political process. And that decision is not President Bush's alone to make. Congress, as a co-equal branch of government, has a responsibility to assist in the initiation of this process. Congress, under Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution, has the war-making power. Congress appropriates funds for the war. Congress does not dispense with its obligation to the American people simply by opposing a troop surge in Iraq. There are 140,000 troops remaining in Iraq right now. What about them? When will they come home? Why should we leave those troops in Iraq when we have the money to bring them home? 
Soon the President's going to ask for more money for the war. Why would Congress appropriate more money to keep the troops in Iraq through the end of President Bush's term at a cost of upwards of two trillion dollars and thousands of more troop casualties when military experts say there's no military solution? Our soldiers stand for us in the field. We must stand for them in the legislature by bringing them home. It's not credible for anyone to maintain that one opposes the war yet continues to fund it. This contradiction runs as a deep fault line through our politics, undermining public trust in the political process and in those elected to represent the people. If you oppose the war, then don't vote to fund it. If you have money which can be used to bring the troops home or to prosecute the war, do not say you want to bring the troops home while you appropriate money in a supplemental to keep them in Iraq fighting a war that cannot be won militarily. This is why the administration should be notified now that Congress will not approve of the appropriations request of up to $160 billion in the spring for the purposes of continuing the occupation and the war. Continuing to fund the war is not a plan. It would represent the continuation of a disaster. The U.S. sent our troops into Iraq without a clear mission. We created a financial, military, and moral dilemma for our nation. And we're now talking about the Iraq war as our problem. The Iraqis are forgotten. Their country's been destroyed, 650,000 casualties. That's based on a Lancet report, which surveyed from March 2003 just to July of 2006. They've seen the shredding of the social fabric of their nation, civil war, lack of access to food, shelter, electricity, clean drinking water, and health care, because this administration, with the active participation of the Congress, authorized the war without reason, without conscience, without international law. The U.S. thinks in terms of solving our military, strategic, logistical, and political problems. The U.S. can determine how to solve our problems, but the Iraqi people are going to have problems far into the future. And I want to say, as I enumerate the step-by-step -step process and how we can get out, Dr. King, when he spoke at Riverside Church about the war in Vietnam, talked about how the war was depriving the people of two nations of an opportunity for a future. He talked about the economic injustice that war brings and brought to two nations. And I'm going to be talking about that this afternoon. But just in brief, Reverend Jackson, I just want to say the elements of the Kucinich plan are this. Number one, the U.S. announces it will end the occupation, close the military bases, and withdraw. Number two, the U.S. announces that it will use existing funds to bring the troops home and the necessary equipment home. Number three, we will order a simultaneous return of all U.S. contractors to the United States and turn over the contracting work to the Iraqi government. Number four, we'll convene a regional conference for the purpose of developing a security and stabilization force for Iraq. Number five, prepare an international security and peacekeeping force to move in, replacing U.S. troops who then return home. Number six, develop and fund a process of national reconciliation. Number seven, we have to once again restart the programs for reconstructions and jobs for the Iraqi people. Number eight, reparations for the damage that's been done to the lives of Iraqis. Number nine, assuring the political sovereignty of Iraq and making sure that their oil isn't stolen. Number ten, repairing the Iraq economy. Number eleven, economic sovereignty for Iraq. And number twelve, an international truth and reconciliation pro uh, process which establishes a policy of truth and reconciliation between the people of the United States and Iraq. Now, parallel with that, and what I'll talk about this afternoon, is a plan to go out of Iraq, because you have to have that plan, and to go back into the United States cities to talk about health care for all, to talk about jobs for all and education for all, to talk about an equitable distribution of the wealth, to talk about how we can use these engines in societies, such as Reverend Jackson talked about, Wall Street, to create more wealth in a society for more people. This is an important moment in this nation. And I'm proud to join Rainbow, Push, and all the other people and organizations represented here in this new direction. This is our moment. We have the power in our hands to chart a new course for the United States and for the world. And it begins with understanding the imperative of human unity. Jesse Jackson's whole life has been about that. And I'm proud to stand here with you, Jesse, to talk about the new directions that we must take, not only with respect to our international policy, but in reconnecting with the world community in an affirmation that what affects any of us affects all of us, in refocusing our attentions and our resources to make this 
the beloved country to make this the shining city on a hill. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.